All right. Okay. So we can start. Um, and uh, and just thanks again to, for coming. And um, I'm so happy. This is like ESIP, like ESIP after three years for me, right? So this is awesome. Um, so um, this session is really focused on the uh, open source air quality analytic collaborative framework. Uh, this is actually it's a portfolio of projects that is uh, uh, funded through the NASA um, AST program. Uh, the goal is really try to uh, you know, create solution that connects uh, different uh, technology component related to um, uh, air quality analysis um, and uh, predictions. Uh, so um, in, for those of you that do not know, uh, well, my name is Thomas, I'm from JPL. I'm actually one of the PIs on the, uh, uh, the air quality analytic uh, collaborative framework project. And, um, and today you're gonna hear um, four uh, uh, presentations on the actual technology uh, components um, and from the team really, um, and, and how we're building this open source solution. So everything we talk about today here is fully open source um, and um, hopefully fully documented by the end of the project, right? Um, and uh, again, we, I also want to thank uh, my co-hosts here today. I have uh, uh, Steve um, and uh, Phil and also Mohammed uh, in the room. And uh, Steve is actually helping us, uh, you know, he will also give a talk at the end about connecting our work back to the ESIP uh, air quality cluster, which is extremely active. I learned that you have three sessions about air quality just this week. That's amazing, right? I guess we care about what we breathe, right? <laughs> All right, so um, without further ado, I'm going to uh, hand the mic over to our first speaker uh, from JPL, Joe Roberts. Uh, he's gonna be presenting remotely. Um, and this is uh, the AST work that he is the, uh, the lead um, um, development engineer for the project. So Joe. All right, thank you, Thomas. Uh, hopefully I'm coming through loud and clear. Uh, sorry, I couldn't be there in person today. I was planning to actually fly out to you, so I have a change plan. So I'm coming to you all remotely. Uh, so I am Joe Roberts. I am a technical lead in the science data visualization group at the NASA Jet Propulsion Laboratory. Um, so I'm going to talk about uh, the Air Quality Analytic Collaborative Framework, or AQACF. And I'm going to focus on more of the high-level system integration architecture. <clears throat> and then I'm going to hand it over to our uh, collaborators um, to talk more specifically about their roles. So we, we partner with the city of Los Angeles and Cal State LA, uh, Washington University in St. Louis, CU Boulder, and George Mason University. Um, so AQACF is, like Thomas mentioned, it, an AIST project or a project funded through the Advanced Information Systems Technology Program at NASA. Um, and our goal is to develop uh, an analytic collaborative framework or ACF specifically for air quality. Um, and the goal here is to really harmonize air quality data sets, models, algorithms across the board so we can facilitate uh, analysis and future projections of air quality across disparate sources. Um, so we're demonstrating uh, different analysis applications um, that I'll talk about later, including um, here specifically in the city of Los Angeles. And this is intended to be a generalized framework to facilitate analyses for air quality applications more broadly. Um, we've established a cloud platform um, on AWS um, that allows for interactive on-demand data analysis and visualization. And we're integrating uh, investments across these different partnerships. So from uh, the high performance GeoCam, uh, GCHP, the GeoCam Geo adjoint model simulations of air pollution health effects, predict what we breathe, and the air quality prediction product generation. Uh, so what is an analytic collaborative framework? Um, so this slide here um, kind of explains that. So um, this enables the confluence of resources for multiple, um, from different sources. So we're using the Apache Science Data Analytics platform. Um, that to really pull together these different technologies. So we're taking data um, from various sources, including the different uh, distributive active archive centers across NASA, um, and, and also from sources just as, such as ground monitors and uh, different models, as I mentioned before. And we're 
bringing them all together in one piece in our AWS architecture um, to really enable to or provide this framework um, for people to come to one place for to do their uh, analyses. Um, so this is a scalable model. Um, it's also distributed. Uh, so we have not just one instance set in AWS, but we, we've also have it um, in other places as well. As well. Um, and this allows us to shift uh, towards data analytics in the cloud, being able to do everything in this cloud environment, um, have algorithms for identifying and extracting interesting features and patterns, um, including making uh, future predictions. Um, so our customers and stakeholders includes uh, scientists from various disciplines, uh, other data centers, and also policymakers. So we're really helping to make, um, uh, helping the policymakers make their decision based on the information that's being collected. Uh, a really important piece of this, uh, as Thomas also mentioned, is this is all open source. So that's kind of the key takeaway of this slide. We're building um, all of our software. It's available in GitHub. Um, and it's available open source, uh, mostly via the uh, Science Data Analytics pl platform or SDAP. And some of the graphics here show um, earlier um, tools that have been built using SDAP in a in similar platform. So this is from the Sea Level Change Portal. Um, we have an echo data analysis tool and more examples here as well. So in di different forms of uh, analyses. Um, okay, so um, this is built Sorry, I'm moving my windows around here. Uh, so this is the AQACF architecture uh, built on SDAP is um, actually like the phrase multi-cloud. So we're not just using AWS, but um, at GMU there is a private cloud that this is also deployed to um, using OpenStack. Um, and we're also enabling high performance computing uh, our machine learning service, we're leveraging some of the uh, offerings from AWS, including SageMaker, um, to uh, make uh, predictions on air quality, which Mohammed will talk about in the, the presentation after this. Um, this is a portable vendor neutral service API for application integration. Um, we're really trying to stream board data onboarding or stream, streamline data onboarding so, to make it easy to get data into the system. Um, we, we also provide examples of how to do interactive on demand analysis using Jupyter Notebooks. Um, in addition to SDAP, we're using the open source on Earth software, um, which is used by NASA Gibbs and Worldview um, to enable rapid visualization. So this is the um, rapid interactive web-based visualizations, but it um, can also be used in in, within a Jupyter Notebook environment. Um, we include a scenario-based numerical simulation and Machine, law, machine learning prediction. Um, and this is model, this architecture is ostensible to support science driven actual prediction, um, such as dynamic data acquisition or instrument retasking. So, this is alluding to um, the other AIST areas, including new observing strategies and digital twins. Uh, it's some of the current data products that we've ingested. So, we're this is still in progress. We're pulling more and more data into AQACF as we speak. Um, but this includes things such as machine learning outputs, um, models from um, the adjoint sensitivities and emissions, um, as well as other models, including, oops, did not mean to advance the slide, um, uh, including models of uh, particular matter, PM 2.5, uh, satellite observations from uh, common instruments, such as VIRS, uh, Mirror 2, Tropomi, uh, other model outputs from GCHP. And we've recently onboarded some in situ products. So we have uh, pollution monitors actually at JPL. We, we have one on top of one, or one of our buildings, zero one, and I think other buildings as well, actually. Um, and other uh, pollution monitoring stations across California and across the country as well. Uh, so here is an example of data harmonization within Jupyter Notebook. So on the left, this is uh, showing that we can do area average time series. So we're looking at um, PM 2.5 over California um, between April 2017 and 2018. And we've run a few lines of code um, that hits our AQACS system. And we're able to do these analytics uh, all within the cloud. Um, 
Similarly, in the middle uh, diagram here, we're uh, displaying a time average map uh, for, the, for the same uh, time span. And then on the right is uh, a quick visualization using WMS that pulls in the map um, at the top for the uh, North America. And, and then here is more focused on uh, California as well. Uh, a little bit more about the visualization platform. Uh, so this is looking at the California wildfires in 2018, which was a bad year um, in, uh, in a list of many bad years recently. Um, so we're pulling in, this is connecting to WMS and we're pulling in the visualization, but it's really um, WMS is, or WMTS as well, which is the tile version. It really shines when we're using an interactive uh, web mapping application. So here's a, a sample GIS web app that um, quickly uh, can visualize data that, that we've ingested into the system. Numerical model integration. Um, so this is showing that we've integrated um, model data from the high performance uh, GS chem. So this is, um, so we're working on being able to uh, submit jobs to GSCP, simulation jobs, uh, get back results that will uh, make its way into AQF and uh, for, for future analysis. So we have, um, here we're looking at uh, anomalies. So there's a, a time series here displaying that. Um, we're also making animations. Um, so this is an animated uh, GIF showing uh, two point, or sorry, PM 2.5 um, for multiple years. So this looks like a, a yearly product. And we're also visualizing, um, de de developing animations from various uh, GC HP parameter outputs. Um, including nitrous oxides, SO2 and O3. Uh, so handling level two products was, was a bit of a challenge. Um, so we're working with the Tropomi products. Um, there's some really um, valuable data here that, that, that we're, we would like in the uh, AQAS, a, a, sorry, the AQACF system. So we developed a pipeline to uh, take the level two swap files, uh, remap them using heel picks uh, at various spatial resolutions. So we're essentially generating a, a greater level three product um, that's finally ingested into AQACF. So this lets us work with the um, data, uh, you know, more harmoniously treated treat it as a greater data product that we can do uh, further analysis on. Uh, so this is a result of looking at Tropomi. Um, so these are different uh, parameters, um, including CO, methane, um, a few more, I think that's uh, NO2, O3, and SO2. Um, so this is looking at California, I believe over um, 2020, and just uh, showing a time series result for, for that um, region and time span. Uh, the other big challenge was, um, handling in situ data. So uh, I'm not gonna go over this uh, diagram in detail, um, but we, we were able to take in situ data from these ground station monitors, um, bring them in via JSON file it's into S3, drop, basically drop them into an S3 bucket, which kicks off a process that um, ingests the data in as a parquet format in S3. Um, and from there, it moves into uh, Spark, where we could do um, optimized data querying um, in, into the system. Um, so that, that was a recent addition to AQACF. Um, okay, so um, the next few slides, I'm, I'm gonna talk about some of the, um, uh, basically introduce the, 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 the work for the next few speakers. So um, first off, we're looking at, uh, the predict what we breathe prediction outputs. So we've ingested these prediction outputs into AQACF and we we're able to do, um, take a look at the data and do some analysis and visualization. So here we're looking at the PM 2.5 prediction outputs. Um, and on the right, uh, it's a kind of a blurry visualization, but this is really the Los Angeles basin and how um, we think the air quality is gonna look like. Um, uh, basically for the next day. Um, although this, this example was from a couple months ago. Um, 
another use case that we're working with uh, with AQACF. So we have a variety of use cases that we're uh, dem demonstrating the system for. One is the California ED mandate, uh, the electronic vehicle mandate. So those of us who live in California know that by 2035, um, California is going to ban the sale of gasoline vehicles. Um, so we're basically looking at how this is going to or affect uh, emissions by 2035. So there's different scenarios where the, um, the emissions have been uh, reduced and we're able to simulate that. And we're gonna hear more about this later um, from one of the next speakers. So I'm gonna kind of gloss over this. Um, there is a Jupyter Notebook example um, that, that we've demonstrated here where um, basically looking at different um, uh, scenarios and, and modifying them uh, in real time to see how, how they look like. Um, so earlier in the talk, I, I mentioned we had uh, multiple or distributed uh, ACF. So we have a community of them. Uh, here we're focusing on air quality, but we do have other um, scientific areas that uh, these technologies have already been demonstrated for, um, including uh, you know sea level, a few specific missions such as Grace, uh, Echo, um, and and so forth. I won't go through, go through all of these, but in the in the left here um, we have the AQACF um, that's running on AWS. That's really being managed by uh, JPL. But at George Mason University, they have their own um, AQACF, so to speak, running on uh, on OpenStack. So we've um, married the two systems together so that um, they're really one distributed system that's, um, if you're accessing the data, it could be pulling from one or the other. Um, another use case example, this is from GMU, um, another one that's gonna, you're gonna hear about more later. Um, looking at the Ukraine conflict. Um, so, so there's been some good research here. Um, another use case is looking at the ports of Belly and Long Beach. Um, so there's been a really large shipping backlog uh, and we're curious to know, um, you know, how, how, what's, what are the effects of the emissions having all these ships off the coast? So um, we can hear more about this later during the session. Um, here are a few slides that show that we're, you know, being, reaching some all-time records um, with PM 2.5 around the, the ports of LA and Long Beach. Um, again, I am just skipping over this because I, I, I believe Phil is going to talk more about them. Uh, it's in situ observation. So uh, I, I mentioned earlier, we have this uh, set of instruments on top of building through one at, at JPL. So, so these are measuring um, different pollutants. Um, so we have, it uh, looks like 10 of them here. And so we have a whole lot of data that's coming in. Uh, we're feeding them into our system at AQ, AQ, ACF. Um, it's actually, this is also available in Purpleware if you go to that website. Um, what I thought was pretty interesting is um, the huge spike in pollution that you see during the 4th of July. So this is actually from last year, but you see this huge um, spike of emissions. And uh, you know, fireworks are banned here in Los Angeles, but that's not stopping people from, um, you know, having good, a good uh, 4th of July celebration, but um, it's not doing a, a good um, for you know, air quality and, and breathing, um, unfortunately. And uh, just a teaser for what's coming up in the future. So we do have uh, a project that this is gonna transition to that's focusing on wildfires. Um, we're looking to do more uh, studies with the, the ship emissions and um, some work with digital, digital twins. So I'm just gonna leave this as a teaser and not talk too much about it uh, coming up in the future. Uh, here's a few recent publications and conferences. And I think this is the last slide. Um, so I, I, don't know, I don't know if we're taking questions at the end or now, but um, I'm gonna end things here. So thank you all very much. Great, thanks, Joe. Yeah, so th that was yeah, that was um, the the firework was kind of interesting because uh, those sensors are actually right above our uh, management's building, 
So my manager cares about it, right? What am I breathing, right? So we actually collected that data, and well, JPL is actually right next to Rose Bowl, uh, Rose Parade football game. That's where they had the fireworks show. So we picked up all this measurement right above where our management building. So like, oh yeah, do that use case. We care about what we breathe there. <laughs> so so that, that was the, the spike. So uh, again, this. Um, I want to see anybody have any quick questions because I know we're a little bit uh, over time, but we do want to save a little bit of time for um, um, afterward. Uh, maybe Steve can actually drive some of the discussion as well. Okay, with that, Joe, thanks a lot, uh, but stay online in case there's going to be questions. Um, next speaker is uh, Dr. Mohammed from CalCOA on predicting what we breathe. Let's see. I'm not a PC person. All right, there you go. All right, um, we need to share the screen. Um, let's get there. You go share. There you go. All right, I can do this, right? Yes. Okay. I pass. Perfect. All right. All right. Is there there? There you go. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Mohammed Purhamayun, Professor of Computer Science and Director of AI and Data Science Research Lab at California State University, Los Angeles, and Today I want to talk about predicting what we breathe. It's a collaborative work between uh, the university, city of Los Angeles, and NASA, and also OpenAQ company. So let's, let's get started. So air pollution is the silent killer. Okay, we all know it, that's why we are here to talk about it. Uh, it's responsible for yearly deaths of at least 7 million people every year. It means that every five seconds, one person dies somewhere in the world prematurely from the effect of air pollution. The first and the most important step in mitigating the risk of air pollution is to understand it, discover it, and predict it in advance. If we can understand and predict air pollution in advance, then local governments, healthcare providers, and etc. can it can help them mitigate the risk and effect of air pollution for sure. The problem is that air pollution prediction is a difficult problem because many, many factors are involved. So look at this graph. This is the PM 2.5 values, particulate matter 2.5, in 2020, the average value over LA County for one year. So as you see, the graph looks completely random. Okay. And when a graph, when, when, when data is random, it means it's unpredictable. But when we collect more data, it turns out that it's not completely random. So, for example, this peak right here in the middle, it is 4th of July, okay? So, firework of 4th of July created a significant peak in the value of PM 2.5 in Los Angeles. Or this orange bands, um, these are a big wildfire that we have back, back in um, September and October in Los Angeles. And as, as you see, it created a huge peak in the value of PM 2.5. This gray curve shows the wind speed. And as you see, wind speed has 
inverse correlation to the value of PM 2.5. When, when wind is higher, air pollution is lower, okay? And look at this blue bands right here. These are um, a rainstorm that we had back in March 2020. And as you see, we had a big reduction in the value of PM 2.5. It was exactly the same time of pandemic declaration and a stay at home order. So it is not clear that this reduction in the value of PM 2.5 was because of a stay at home order or because of those rainstorm or both. Okay. And this green area is the average of PM 2.5 values from past two years, 2018 and 19. And when we compare that, you see that in many parts, the 2020, except that this, except that this part, that a, a random wildfire happened, but in other parts, mostly the um, pattern follows the patterns of past years. So it means that we can learn from historical data to make prediction for future. Okay, so it means that generally speaking, it is not completely random. It is to some degree predictable. This one shows uh, nitrogen dioxide, NO2, the same situation as you see again, the, the inverse um, correlation between wind speed and um, air pollution is clear, and this wildfire creates a huge peak in the value of PM 2.5 and etc. So again, a stay at home order because of the pandemic and rainstorm created a big reduc significant reduction in the value of NO2 as well. So what can we do to predict air pollution? We need to take into account all factors that have impact on air quality, or at least provide some information about air quality. We have to collect them, process them, plus process that data, and use them for our system. And more importantly, we, we, we need, because this is a huge amount of data from many different sources. So it is almost impossible to process that manually. So we need a very complex machine learning model, an AI model that can process this data, discover patterns, learn from data, and create a predictive model that can be used for future. So this is the goal. And this is what we have done in the past three years. And this was our work. Um, we have developed eight different models for predicting the main air uh, pollutants in short term and long term. So these are two examples for prediction the va predicting the value of PM 2.5. We compare that with reference grade sensors, reference grade level, ground level sensors, and to validate our results, the orange curve shows the, our prediction, and the blue one is the actual value. And as you see, uh, it was a very uh, good uh, prediction. I, I'm going to show you some of the values and errors and accuracy later. So as I said, uh, um, we have to collect a lot of data from many different sources. I'm going to talk about the data later. Um, we have developed eight different models. They are all based on advanced deep learning model, very deep learning model. So we have several levels of deep learning, uh, machine learning models, unsupervised learning to reduce the dimensionality of the data, especially for some of the data sets. The dimensionality is very high, for example, meteorological data. We need to apply some unsupervised learning method to reduce the dimensionality of data as data compression and um, or feature selection. And then we combine all of those data as different channels of our deep learning model. These are the main data sets that we have used in our system, um, almost all of them on open source open data. Uh, first of all, we have several data sets from NASA. Um, we have NAS NASA AOD, um, satellite observations uh, for different values of air pollutants. We have tropomy data, 
from NASA as a ESA data, uh, data set. Uh, we use several products of NASA uh, that shows wildfires, such as Miser product, um, Equestress, and some other um, data, such as um, fire, power, radiation, and so on. These are the data sets that represent wildfire, because wildfire is a very big challenge in California, and this is a, one of the main sources of air pollution especially in summertime. Um, we use two different types of ground level sensors, in situ sensors, um, low cost sensors um, that are usually um, uh, community maintained sensors. For example, we use 48 purple air sensors that are community maintenance sensors. We use 32 AQMD sensors. They are all low cost sensors. We also use reference grade sensors that are very accurate sensors. They have a very good um, calibration and maintenance on timely basis. We not only use them for training, but also we use these accurate sensors for validation and evaluating the accuracy of our model for future prediction. And one of the most important part of our data is meteorological data, including wind speed, wind direction, humidity, temperature, pressure, and so on. So some of these data sets need pre-processing, cleaning, outlier, removal, and um, sometimes at the beginning we did a lot of feature extraction and feature selection to understand which one of those data sets are better for our application. Um, so these are the main data uh, for meteorological data, especially because the data is multi dimensional it has many different channels wind direction wind speed um, humidity temperature pressure etc et we applied a neural a deep neural network model in an unsupervised fashion for dimensional reduction to pack it in a very meaningful data set that can be used in our machine learning model and it will be a channel of the, our data all of this data will will be provided to our very deep uh, neural network models with many, many hidden layers. It takes a long time for training the network, of course, but training is a one step process. Prediction is the, uh, is very fast. And this is an example. This is how, this is how our model predicts air quality in real time. Okay, everything has implemented on AWS, SageMaker, everything in real time. So this is the real time prediction of air quality in Los Angeles area for PM 2.5 in this example. But we do the same thing for ozone, NO2 and CO. The accuracy, as you see, the average accuracy for 24 hour prediction is about 95% accuracy, 94.56% accuracy. When we compare that for 16, for 13 uh, reference grade sensors that are the most accurate ground level sensors to measure air quality. As you see in this example, um, the Temporal resolution is on hourly basis, and spatial resolution is one square kilometer. So each one of those small tiles here represent one square kilometer in the in the in the LA County. So this is the most accurate um, uh, with this resolution that have been developed so far, at least among the system that I'm aware of. And uh, as I said, everything has been developed on SageMaker, on AWS, or real-time prediction. Let me show you some numbers about the accuracy of the system. Uh, so these are two different cases. As I said, we developed short-term prediction models and long-term prediction models. Short-term prediction model can predict on hourly basis for 24 hours in future. Long-term prediction can predict 
um, on daily basis for 10 days in future. So you can see the accuracy of our model on um, um, seven different um, locations with reference grade sensors that are very accurate. As you see, 94% and 95% accuracy in predicting uh, PM 2.5. These are the graphs. And uh, when we go to long-term prediction for 48 hours in future, the average over all of the locations in LA County is 93%. Four days in future, 90%. Six days in future, 88%. Person and of course it makes sense when we move forward to the future, the accurate the prediction accuracy will be lower and lower a little bit because the correlation from ten days to now will be less than forty-eight hours to now. But that's still and the prediction for ten days in future based on only the data of today. Okay, so we don't have any data from now to ten days is about 80%. Um, same result for ozone, as you see. Um, um, we validated that in 13 different locations. So Los Angeles has 13 different um, reference grade sensors, the most accurate types of ground level sensors to measure ozone. And we compare our prediction results with these this is 48 hour prediction in future. And as you see, the results in different locations. Same thing for NO2, again, high accuracy. And this is a very interesting graph I wanted to show you. Um, the, we consider two different cases. When we use wildfire data and when we, when, when we don't use wildfire data. So as you see, when we use wildfire data, the accuracy is a little bit better. As I said, wildfire is very important, is one of the main sources of air pollution, in, especially in wildfire season, which is end of summer and early winter, early uh, fall. And the, the results is like for 46 hours in future, 92 hours in future, and et cetera, for NO2 and PM2.5. Okay, so this, these are the results on Los Angeles. We applied our model to three different cities, other than LA, in three different continents, Europe, um, Southern America, and Africa. So the first example is Mexico City. Um, well, in, 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 this is interesting that Mexico City, they already have a simple predictive model for air pollution. This is something that most of our cities in, in the United States, we don't have a system like that. But make, Mexico City had a pretty good system. Well, it, it was an old system, so it was not based on AI and machine learning and this kind of technology, but at least they had some system that could predict to some level. Um, so this, these are our prediction results, uh, again, for these different locations in the Mexico City that they have, um, again, accurate reference grade sensor. So we compared our prediction with these values. And this is the average accuracy over two months from November 1st to December 31st. When we compared, so this is the comparison that they made, actually. We didn't have access to their predictive model. Uh, so this is, the, they, this is their old predictive model that they had. And this is what they created. Um, but this is this is the, this is what our model um, created for the prediction um, for for the city of Mexico City. We tried in London. Um, London also had a pretty good ground level sensor network uh, to measure air pollution. Um, so this is our prediction. So these are downtown and. and London that is, uh, as you see, has a uh, high air, air, bad air quality. And, but we, and we validated the data 
um, again, there was some issues with uh, processing the ground level data in, in other cities. So in the United States, it's easy. Um, they, they have a standard for cre creating the data, but when we want to work with other cities, well, the ground level data at least needs some pre-processing, but um, the satellite data is the same. Okay, so we use NASA data, we use ESA data, wildfire data, those NASA data sets and products are the same everywhere, so it doesn't matter. So it's a, it's a standard universal format. And finally, uh, the, the last city was Durban, South Africa. Uh, Africa. Um, unfortunately, in Durban, South Africa, they had only four sensors, four ground level sensors to measure air quality. And this was a little challenging. So again, as I said, all of those, like we have seven different data sets that we use uh, combined together as a package to our predictive model. Um, all of them are the same um, universal and we can get it from NASA, so no issues. Only the sensor data that we use for the training and validation um, is local. Um, so in, um, in America, it's not local. In America, there are many websites like Purple Air and Air Now and AQMD and etc. that they provide the ground level values of sensors for everywhere in the United States. But when we want to work with another country, some of these data are not public and we have to get it from the local government. So they had only four sensors. And these are the results, again, based on these four sensors, um, very good accuracy on predicting um, and the air quality. So we applied our model on different locations to make sure that this is not a specifically designed for LA. It is a universal system and can work everywhere. Uh, as I said, several teams and many people have been involved in the project. Uh, Gene Home from City of LA. Um, I'm from uh, Cal State LA. Chris from OpenAQ. Don is the project manager for our work. And Paul also, and um, um, Iron from um, uh, City of Los Angeles, we are working together. And the team of students at California State University that helped me, well, actually there are more, but these are just five of them that I hear. There are 10 more students that had been involved in this project over the past three years that we developed this work. All right, um, we have published 14 peer reviews papers on this research so far in the past three years. If you are interested, some of them are open source. At least two of the journals, these two journals that I put here are open source. So you can click on it and see the, see the journal. And some other journals and many conference papers. Overall, 14 peer reviews papers we, we published on this work. And that's it. Thank you so much for your time. Let me know if you have any questions. Any immediate question for Mohammed? Thank you. That was a great talk. I was wondering uh, if you know if the accuracy that you're getting in your models, is this the state of the art or are there other models out there that are similarly accurate? Other models developed by other, other people, you mean? Yeah, like just out there um, yeah, so in the field. We, we, as we are aware of, so we, we, we reviewed many, many people's uh, the, the results of other other researchers all around the world uh, with this special and temporal resolution to the date as i'm ever this is the most accurate system
She shared the GitHub link. This is not a question. This is, I think, a GitHub link. Um, I have a question. Oh, yeah. There you go. Go for it. Um, this is Hazem from uh, ASDC Atmospheric Science Data Center, um, uh, Langley Research Center. My question is, uh, did you use digital elevation models uh, to train your model? Um, I see you have a lot of uh, satellite data and ground uh, sensors. So uh, I thought the elevation of the location um, is going to be um, to be very um, important um, in your predictions. Thank you. Well, for training, we used uh, almost five years of data uh, from maybe six, from 2016 to 2021. And there was the data that we use for training our model. So training process have been very time consuming because we used a huge data, uh, five years of data, and there were many different sources. So meteorological, and two types of ground level sensors, NASA data, wildfire data, and etc. And we tested our model on one year of the data. Okay, I think we have to move along. Um, we're going to have some time later up for questions. We have two more presentations. Okay, after this. thank you, right. everyone. Okay, great. Thank you so much. <laughs> um, let me stop this. All right, okay. So um, just, you know, I, I know the, the work that Mohammed and his uh, team is doing of fabulous job in doing the predictions. One of the things that, that, that we are working on the AQACF effort, uh, what Joe Roberts just presented, is create operational AI, right? How do you sustain this model? How do you automatically retrain and redeploy this model? So this is one of the efforts that the team is building, is taking the, the model that he's got and how do we automate that whole process? So uh, when he, uh, when we get new observation, that model, that one's, that you uh, that uh, Joe showed earlier will get updated automatically with the latest prediction. So that's one of the effort that we're doing. One of the bars, the requirements uh, for AQ work that we uh, got from my sponsor is to be able to support scenario-based uh, analysis and scenario-based predictions. Um, so this is uh, our next speaker, uh, Omar uh, from Colorado uh, uh, University. He is going to give us a talk. Oops, what happened to this? on his work um let's see omar are you there okay okay yeah hello everyone can you hear me yeah hang on all right, all right. um so yeah hello everyone my name is omar and i'm a phd candidate in davin Henze's group at the university of colorado at boulder um and today i'm really excited to share with you the early version of a tool we've developed as part of the NASA Air Quality Analytic Collaborative Framework that is capable of estimating the health impacts that are associated with air pollution exposure and projecting how uh, potential changes in emissions from proposed scenarios could impact these health impacts in future years, specifically in Los Angeles, California. And I'll begin with a little bit of motivation and methodological background of our work, as well as an overview of the satellite-derived air quality products we use before discussing this uh, electric vehicle mandate that Joe touched on earlier. And then lastly, I'll end with a brief demonstration of the tool. So regardless of your background, anyone who has experienced poor air quality is aware that it's detrimental to your health. Um, one example from where I am currently in Colorado is if there's a large fire to the west of us here and you go outside to exercise, you may have difficulty exercising due to all the smoke exposure. Um, what is oftentimes surprising though is the global scope of the impacts that are associated with air pollution exposure. The Global Burden of Disease Study, or GBD, in 2019 estimated that around 6.7 million premature deaths occurred due to exposure to air pollution, making it the leading environmental risk factor for, death, for premature death and outweighing other overall risk factors like high body mass index, malnutrition, and alcohol use. And about 4.5 million of these total deaths are estimated to be attributable to ambient pollution and exposure, specifically, which is air pollution exposure outside as opposed to indoor air pollution. Um, and then there are a number of pollutants that are associated with poor health. Uh, exposure to fine particulate matter, or PM2.5, has been associated with an increased risk of early death from a number of health outcomes, 
uh, including ischemic heart disease, stroke, and lung cancer, to name a few. Exposure to ozone has been associated with an increased risk of premature death from chronic obstructive pulmonary disorder, or COPD. And then exposure to nitrogen dioxide has been associated with an increased incidence of new cases of asthma in children. So uh, when health impact assessments are performed, they naturally motivate policy action as cities and larger areas are interested in this large health burden. So I have an example on this slide, the cross-state air pollution rule in the US, which aims to reduce the transport of emissions across state lines that originate from power plants. Um, and policies and plans are also developed at the urban scale to address city level pollution. But regardless of the scale, for policies to be successful at reducing pollution and its associated health impacts, they must be informed um, of their effectiveness. And the project I'll share with you today is an example of this. We develop an interactive means of quantifying the health impacts that are associated with different emission scenarios um, from different areas of impl implementation, as well as different emission sectors. So uh, in this work, we've developed a methodology that I've simplified into six steps on this slide to demonstrate how we can use adjunct sensitivities to characterize the source of pollution, as well as to assess impacts of changes in emissions associated with emission scenarios. So we begin by running a standard air quality model simulation and consider a single model output. So these are concentrations of a pollutant like PM2.5. We can then combine that model output with population data in a mask file to characterize pollutant exposure. So this is how a specific population, like population of Los Angeles, is exposed to a pollutant like PM2.5. Additionally, in step three, we apply satellite-derived scaling factors to complete the definition of what we call the cost function. This cost function is the pollutant exposure, so how population in Los Angeles is exposed to PM2.5. And we use this cost function in the adjoint component of our model, and the adjoint will perform a reverse integration of that standard air quality model and calculate how sensitive that cost function is to emissions of different precursor species. So these adjoint sensitivities, which is what the adjoint model outputs, are essentially a characterization of how much a certain pollution concentration in Los Angeles would change uh, with respect to some change in emissions. And these are really useful because we can combine these adjunct sensitivities with emission scenarios to determine how the cost functions or the pollution exposures in Los Angeles will change, which is step five. And then lastly, we calculate the health impacts that are associated with pollutant exposures and these contributions from emission scenarios. So I'll only go into detail on two of these steps as the rest are either pretty well documented or relatively straightforward. And I've included a few uh, studies and some of these steps if you're curious about any of them. Um, and here we'll begin with this discussion of the inclusion of satellite derived data. So we use satellite derived data to capture fine scale concentration gradients to improve pollutant exposure estimates in individual cities or countries. Uh, and the air quality that we, we use to simulate pollutant information, which is GeoSCAM, is relatively coarse. So grid cells range from about 25 kilometers squared to 250, depending on your domain and your simulation. Um, but the satellite derived products that we use are available at a much finer resolution, generally on the order of about a kilometer squared. Um, so in our work, as I mentioned earlier, we're not only curious about pollution levels or concentrations, but also how populations are exposed to that pollution. So having these fine resolution products available allows us to more appropriately characterize how different populations are exposed to pollution. So on this slide, I have examples of two satellite drive products. On the top here are uh, surface level PM2.5 concentrations. And this is from a study by Van Donkler et al. in 2021. Um, and this is based off Modus AOD as well as other AOD products. And then here at the bottom is uh, surface level NO2 concentrations from a study by Cooper et al. in 2022. And these are based off Tropomi data. Um, and we don't consider any satellite derived surface level ozone products as they haven't really been developed. Uh, but due to the longer atmospheric lifetime of ozone concentrations, they tend to have weaker spatial gradients anyway. So you'd, you'd expect to see more uh, higher spikes related to PN2.5 and NO2 than you would for ozone. So next, I'll discuss how we calculate this, the contribution that a mission scenario can have on pollution in a city like Los Angeles. So the adjunct model outputs these sensitivities, which are the lambda term here. And these can be combined with emissions data from a scenario. And by summing over all other dimensions, we can estimate how much that emission scenario contributed to the cost function J. So we can use this approach to conduct what we call emission scenario impact assessments, in which delta E represents some proposed change in emissions, like related to that California EV mandate. 
Um, and then we can combine that with the adjunct sensitivities, which characterize how sensitive uh, pollutant exposures in Los Angeles are to changes in emissions and estimate how much the pollution in Los Angeles would change with respect to that change in emissions. So our tool was developed specifically to assess how changes in emissions could impact pollution-related health impacts in the city of Los Angeles. So on this slide, we include the pollution products for PM2.5, ozone, and NO2, along with some population data for the city of Los Angeles. The PM2.5 and NO2 I mentioned already, where those come from, the ozone is from a simulation of geoschem. So there's a surface level ozone concentrations from geoschem. And then the population data comes from the gridded population of the world data set version four. So um, I'll just go over this briefly because Joe kind of already touched on this, but um, while we de developed this tool to be kind of flexible, we are kind of modeling a, a single scenario to begin with, that's just this California electric vehicle mandate for 2035, uh, in which 35% of new vehicles sold in California are expected to be electric by 2026, which will increase to 68% in 2030, and then hopefully 100% in 2035. And then you can see the estimates of the improvement in both greenhouse gases and NOx emissions in form of reductions um, from this action. So uh, with that, I will switch over to our tool here. Uh, can you all see the tool? Um, let me know if not, but uh, I'll kind of briefly walk through this, uh, the format of this, and then kind of model a scenario. So you can see here at the top, we have four slider bars, which represent different emission sectors. So transportation, energy, agriculture, and industry. And we can manipulate these, um, these emissions so essentially we can model emission increases by 30% or a decrease by whatever percent. Um, we can do this for all four sectors here. Um, and then we can also select the specific pollutant that we're curious about, um, PM2.5, ozone, and NO2. And then here at the bottom is the kind of the bar charts where we see or we estimate the number of health outcomes that are associated with this emission action. Um, so on the y-axis is the total number of health impacts and for PM2.5 and ozone, these are premature deaths. For NO2, that's asthma cases. And then on the x-axis here, you see four ticks corresponding to municipal, county, state, and North America. Um, so uh, these represent the area of implementation of our scenarios. So the municipal tick represents what if just the city of Los Angeles adopted this emission reduction action? What would the health benefits in Los, An uh, Los Angeles be? Um, move up to the county level, if, if Los Angeles County adopted this action, what would the health benefits and the city of Los Angeles be, and so on and so forth. Um, so with that, the, uh, the EV mandate uh, estimated 35% uh, reduction in uh, the sale, or I guess 35% of the sales of vehicles will be electric in, I believe, 2026. So if we just considered a really simple example where transportation emissions is reduced at the same amount, we can see estimate what the health benefits of that action would be. So for PM2.5, if just the city of Los Angeles adopted this mandate, about 300 deaths would be avoided in 2026. Um, but if the entire state adopted the mandate, as is the, the plan, um, around 460 from two deaths would be avoided. Um, so you can kind of see the benefit of larger areas of action. And you can model different scenarios, like what would happen if there's uh, increased industrial emissions from this mandate for um, development of more electric vehicles or uh, increased energy demand. And you can see this kind of reduces the total health benefits, although there's still a net positive uh, for PM2.5. Um, but yeah, I think, let me go back here and that's all I got. So thank you for your attention. And if you don't get a chance to ask me a question now, you can email me at the email on this slide. Thank you. That was great, Omar. This is actually sweet, and sweet right? Any <laughs> questions? Any online questions? Okay, all right. So we're gonna uh, switch over to our next speaker. Um, and Omar, if you can stay, uh, we might have other question afterwards. Um, so our, uh, besides the, the, the predictions and scenario base, uh, we are also working with the George Mason University on um, value-added data uh, generations. Um, and uh, Dr. Phil Yang is going to be presenting his work. You're a PC yeah, guy, right? You know, right. George. Yeah, thank you, Thomas. Uh, yep.
Now I'm trying to get my slides. It's, uh, yeah, this is the one. Uh, is it shared? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And this first. And um, uh, that's it. How about now? Good. That's good. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, well, uh, thank you, Chen. Um, thank you, Thomas, for organizing this, uh, this session. Yeah. It's, um, it's great to hear what has been done in this AQACF big project that Thomas is, uh, Thomas is coordinating, um, so that I don't have to go into the details of uh, what has been presented, and that kind of sets the foundation for what I'm gonna talk about. So I'm uh, Phil Young from George Mason, and this is part of the AQACF effort uh, to improve the spatial temporal ground level air quality uh, using an open science and digital twin approach uh, for virus pollutants as examples. Uh, so why we're doing this, we heard from, uh, for example, Mohammed was talking about every year we have 7 million people or more uh, premature death. And there's more if you count the health um, that's related to their quality issues. So on the other side, for the data that we need to support the decision making that could help saving lives, as you say, from the simulation, which was done uh, by our Colorado uh, collaborators, um, we do not have uh, very good, in fact, recording data sets because um, the data sets we have today is uneven and sparsely distributed, especially for the ground level monitoring. Uh, sensors and there are gaps for site height observations, which is a lot of data source, as you heard. Uh, for example, there may be daily data sets or there may be a few hours if you have wildfire or um, traffic jams, the events may have been gone if you get daily data sets. So the temporal resolution is a key here. Uh, this study for our part, the object based learning to fuse a variety of earth observation data sets including the site height observation and meteorologic factors and ground observation and also some socioeconomic data sets. This is a part we're still working on to collect data sets, for example, the power factories and the transportation that Tom's uh, uh, was uh, mentioning about 2035 and Jill mentioned that um, how that uh, act in California will impact the uh, air pollution in the next 10 years. Uh, so we are collecting some kind of uh, source for the air pollution data sets and to develop a high accuracy and full coverage PM 2.5 data sets based on the models. In this case, uh, in addition to what um, uh, Mohammed has been doing on the machine learning or deep learning models, we're also typing into the geophysical model set. In this case, we're using the wolf Kim model to have the source as input try to improve from the geophysical prediction side. So eventually we are integrating uh, advanced cyber infrastructure, which serves as the infrastructure to enable uh, the high level integration and uh, data production as uh, Thomas mentioned. So the research uh, task for us is we need to integrate the computing infrastructure. As uh, Thomas mentioned, we have HPC uh, at GMU. Thanks for uh, Dan Duffy from Goddard and also uh, the AST program, we would be able to piece together 600 computing uh, platform, which includes three parts. One of them is HPC. So we're using that for model simulations. The WAF Kim requires a lot of computing power. And we also have the cloud computing site, uh, which is used to support the collaboration or the bridging between GMU and uh, uh, JPL as that instance within the AWS cloud. And also use the big data analytics and digital twin, as you can see from two use cases, we're gonna 
uh, talk about how we use the analytics, which is in open source domain, try to detect how different events impact the air quality change. So there's a lot of things on the model side. Uh, I'm not going to go into details of this, which includes both the deep learning model and also the geophysical modeling side. The geophysical side include two parts, the wolf kim simulation and also the Waxel based it's kind of the agent based modeling. So once we have, for example, the cars, the factory and the oil draining, we can put them as agent or what we call digital twins eventually could be uh, get into that. For every source of pollution, we can input into the geophysical model. Uh, so based on that, we can predict and have a better record data sets. And based on that, we can do some analysis to, to analyze the are calling impact by different events. For example, in this case, we're looking at LA ship backlog and also the Ukraine conflict, how that impacts their quality. So the cyber infrastructure side, uh, as I said, we have uh, the 600 computing nodes, three computing cluster, with one of them as a HPC, uh, which hosts the models, the geophysical model. And also we have a cloud, a private cloud, OpenStack. We're discussing why we need a private cloud uh, we already have AWS. We tried to run this in the AWS, and our students are very keen on experimenting different examples when they run that. For example, they could spin um, five uh, GPU loads cluster for like one week. And if you go back after one week to check the bill, it's like $5,000. And if we keep doing that for our students' experiment, that's not sustainable. So that's why we put together a private cloud using OpenStack. And also we have a CDH uh, using for, to do the big data analytics. But we do have connection to the AWS to use the resource when we need, for example, 99.99% uh, availability or reliability, then we do need to look up to that because the UNOC data center, it's not so reliable in comparison to the AWS commercial. So there's some kind of, uh, trade-off between the two clouds we're leveraging for this research. And this kind of setup, in fact, uh, perfectly matched into uh, Thomas and I envision for uh, the GMU piece and working together in collaboration with uh, JPL. Is on the GMU side, we're putting together those different types of data sets and using, fit them into the uh, regression model, the machine learning model, and then the geophysical, the wolf model, and produce those results and through a test and validation, part them publish those data sets in the S-type service, uh, which is the software, in fact, integrated and opened by uh, Tom's team. And we would be able to leverage that without changing the code itself. So that's the beauty of our open source. And we can just reuse that. And the two instance, uh, one at GMU, one at JPO, the AWS instance, would be able to talk to each other seamlessly, uh, as uh, Joe showed at the beginning. So this is one of the example. We would be able to, uh, for example, use a full computing nodes cluster to serve the data sets itself. So that's part of it. And then uh, able to call this from the AWS instance to analyze the um, LA ship backlog uh, problem and a lot of part is to analyze the air quality impact by the Ukraine war uh, in the past few months. And these are the four parts we have been working on. So I'm going to skip that and jump right into the use case. So on the use case part, we looked at two of them. One is the air quality impact by the LA ship backlog. We know that the ship start to increase numbers in 2021 July and increase that to a historical number by November. And when it gets to November time, uh, we see that's a big problem over there. So some ships were pushing out to the ocean side, it's somewhere here. So there's a time change. That's what you say here, uh, increasing ship numbers and then decreasing in November time. And we see state, um, statistically the NO2 anomalies was kind of increasing and then decreasing uh, in the December, uh, January timeframe. So that's the initial statistics. And when we get into more details, like the geographic region of this uh, area, 
So we use the open source uh, that we developed to pull the data sets from uh, several sources, uh, including the oral OMI and topomi data sets and also the ground-based air pollution data sets, go through this workflow. And then we were able to generate the data sets as you see here on this map. Uh, this is the visualization of um, uh, NO2 data sets, as you see from September to October to November. The sheep number, the red line here is jumping, is increasing a lot. And on this map, you can see that the NO2 is building up from September, October to November. But when we get to December time frame, when the ships were pushing out to the ocean, you can see the increasing of NO2 in the ocean side. Uh, but in the coastal line here, you see the better air quality along the coast and also in the port region. So we would be able to use the infrastructure we built uh, to do this analysis, see how the ship backlog has been impacting the air quality in the LA ship uh, uh, ports area. So a lot of part is on the Wolf Kim. So in this part, we are using the Wolf Kim. In fact, this part, we just uh, kind of get started uh, last month to keep it running for the California region. In this case, you see that the wildfire and the meteorologic conditions and some of the in situ sensor input were put in here, but not all of them yet. We're still going through the purple error data reading quality control and validation process because uh, we know there's a lot of purple error sensors, but the reading of that is not very reliable. Sometimes the difference could be 50%. So we're going through that process, try to uh, have a good target data sets so that could become part of the input to the uh, geophysical models. So once we have this, we're gonna fuse them together. And this uh, is uh, the wildfire. In fact, you can see how that impacts the quality in Northern California and Southern uh, California. So a lot of use cases, the Ukraine war, uh, the conflict after it started, you can see that uh, that was around about this time. And in 2022, we see that there's a big jump of uh, NO2 by this time. Uh, but after that, it has an uh, increase. And if you look at specific regions, for example, those uh, cities with uh, hot ground battle going on, you can see uh, some of them has an increase of um, um, NO2, uh, but other places has a big decrease. So a lot of part we looked at is the light time light. In fact, this is um, uh, obvious that we look at these different cities uh, from Mirupol, uh, Kiev, Kherson, and others. You can see that the light time light before the war started and after the war started, we looked at, um, in this case, two weeks of data sets, we see that a big drop uh, in nighttime light. Some of them goes up to 40%. Uh, some, the average is at about 20 to 30% for those uh, cities. So also, thanks to the infrastructure, we would be able to build and uh, we can show this once the war starts. And then uh, after about two weeks, we would be able to produce this. And the source code, in fact, for all those I just talked about is on GitHub. I have the link here. Uh, I don't know, Tom's. maybe we can share the slides after uh, the, the, the session. So there's a lot of uh, also looking at the NO2 specifically in Ukraine. Uh, I don't have the, uh, the map shown here, but tomorrow, Anusha, uh, who's uh, also here, is gonna do a demonstration in tomorrow's poster session. So please stop by and uh, check how we would be able to pull together this using the AQACF uh, infrastructure. Um, yeah, that's uh, in summary, we would be able to use advanced information technologies to build the cyber infrastructure that supports their coin data uh, processing. And we build a STAP instance so that could talk with uh, the GPL AWS STAP instance seamlessly pull data sets uh, from the GMU instance, almost uh, with a very similar performance in terms of uh, time. And we would be able to integrate the Earth observation and in situ sensor data sets. There's more to be done, uh, but some initial results has been produced. 
and continuous data sets, in fact, for PM2.5, we retrieved, uh, it's different from Mohammed has been working on, retrieved from GOSAR data sets continuously. Uh, we get about 83% accuracy. And also we're setting up the wolf kin model to have both the simulation in situ observation and also satellite observation. So we, we could eventually have three way uh, to have hopefully better a higher accuracy uh, air pollution data sets. Uh, yeah, these are some future research. Um, we are going to conduct a formal model test. In fact, this is a part we need to collaborate with Mohammed is about to take a look at different deep learning models, see how they perform the best for, for example, for air quality and for NO2, for PM2.5, probably different models will perform different and also test the performance uh, about how to optimize each of those models for PM2.5, for ozone, for NO2, for SO2. Uh, they will have different performance and also analyze the patterns of the meteorological factors. So that could fit into both the machine learning model and also the geophysical model life, uh, like wolf Kim, and also to standardize the tools so that we can release in a formal open source, contributing maybe to the open science and also to digital trends uh, eventually. And so, yeah, uh, in fact, for this uh, project, we get a lot of help from the NSF start intense. So in that project, we engage about uh, 10 uh, two-year associate degree students uh, for the opportunity, this opportunity given to them, they would be able to change their career path from a two-year associate degree uh, went on to a four-year degree uh, in computer science, information and data science in Georgia Tech and Florida State. So that, that was great. Yeah, these are some publications and thank you. Thank you, Pete, we'll see there. Any, is there any question for Phil? All right, okay. Um, so the, um, if you want to learn more about the whole open source effort to, to do this work, uh, I encourage you to look into also uh, the upcoming ApacheCon. I look forward to talk by uh, Stephanie Perez. Uh, we are, uh, our paper got accepted. We will be presenting at ApacheCon to, in October, New Orleans, um, about all the work that we've been working through this team, how they get into the Apache Software Foundation. Um, and again, we are uh, building this toward uh, our digital twin uh, capability. I think we got a lot of the uh, uh, input earlier by the team uh, in the previous session about how to you know, compare models, how to compare, select the right data, how to be smarter about what we include into the, sim, uh, the, the, uh, the digital twin um, for you know, things like air quality analysis. So, so that is something that I'll be happy to talk with uh, Phil and uh, Mohammed about, and again, he mentioned about internship. Definitely, if you are a student, you want to do internship, definitely come to talk with us. JPL is always hiring. I'm a supervisor there. All right. Okay. So um, I want to really to connect this session with the active community of air quality effort at um, um, at ESIP uh, Federation. Uh, I think everybody care a lot about the air quality, the, what we're breathing. And I'm really happy to see the the uh, the, the critical mass that the uh, the team like uh, Steve and, and Beth and, and Phil being being and uh, putting together. So I'm, I'm going to ask Steve to give us a talk and connect, uh, highlight some of the efforts uh, that we that they're doing at um, ESIP. So I'm going to switch. I'm going to open your presentation, Steve. Yeah. Which one is okay. this? Yeah. Right at the top there. Okay, the first one. I think it's already shared, right? The screen. Let's find out. How we? Uh, yeah. yeah. Of course, it's Microsoft, right? Driving a truck. So it's actually working. <laughs> All right. Well, good afternoon or good morning or whatever it is. If anyone's in a different time zone, and yes, I'm Steve Young. Uh, I'm a retired Environmental Protection Agency employee. So I worked on environmental stuff uh, there at EPA for literally decades. I am now co-chairing 
the air quality cluster group at ESIP and Beth Huffer. In the back of the room is my fellow co-chair and Karen Moe, who's also here as a long-term, uh, I think, could I call you a co-chair emerita, uh, Karen? So um, I wanna give you some kind of closing thoughts from our perspective, uh, but I'm gonna be a little bit of a provocateur. So, uh, you know, some of this is personal opinion. Don't blame the cluster if I say something that you don't uh, like. Um, you've already heard it a lot, you know, air quality matters, depending on which source you look at, anywhere from 4 million, 7 million. I believe that WHO just uh, issued a report and they're saying 10 million excess deaths globally uh, per year from air quality. But it's not just that people are dying, the uh, range of health effects is very broad. And that was covered a little bit earlier, but you know, just to review, um, one thing that didn't come up in an earlier presentation is neurological impacts. And there's a very interesting piece uh, in the current um, AGU's EOS journal about work that I think uh, NASA was involved in looking at ozone exposures and the development of depression in adolescents. And they found, I would call it an association, so it doesn't prove cause and effect, but it's pretty thought provoking, uh, that kind of work. And if you look at the amount of craziness in the world right now, you know, uh, maybe, just maybe, air pollution could be a subtle driver of some of that. It's, to me, it's thought provoking. It's also not only human health, but uh, billions of dollars in crop damage. Ozone is very detrimental to plants. And uh, NASA's done some really interesting work in that area too that I think deserves more attention. When you're talking about billions of dollars of economic loss for farmers that you can directly attribute to ozone, that's significant. And finally, I don't think anyone has specifically mentioned this afternoon the vulnerable communities, but there's been a tremendous amount of work recently and vulnerable communities tend to face disproportionate impacts from air quality. So it's important to remember that and just more and more literature about, about that issue. And uh, yeah, unfortunately, the problem in many respects is getting worse. The combination of climate change and also simply growing human population, we're creating feedback loops that are very damaging. Heat waves, uh, excessive heat and bad air, really bad news. So, you know, open science, open source is so vital for making progress in this area. I think the age old research to operations challenge comes to mind. We've heard about really wonderful work that's going on that I'd call more in understandably kind of the research academia mode. And the more that we're able to capitalize a work like this and bring it into operational use, you know, that'll be tremendously beneficial. The FAIR principles, you know, really important. Striving for interoperability and scalability across models. And I, I think that's been touched on pretty well. Uh, actionable information. Can, can we provide information, not just data, but information that people are able to act on, make better decisions? And some of those decisions are all the way down at the personal level. Is there something that I can do to help protect my health as an individual, all the way up to the highest levels of policy making, um, you know, global responsibility. But what can I do about it, you know, is a theme I'll return to in a second, I think. Um, yeah, can the community provide good guidance to expose populations? So back to that, what, what can I do about it? Uh, are there some practical measures that people can take? Um, and can that be sort of developed in a community type of context so that you get better and better guidance developed through collaborations? The idea of building communities of practice, dialogues with users, leveraging community or citizen science initiatives. So Purple Air has come up a lot. I think Purple Air is super cool. It does have limitations, but there's so much power to these uh, community science approaches. And, um, you know, 
I think that that's tremendously important and being able to fuse those data with data, satellite data, other, other data streams. Um, building apps that can be used in the field by uh, kind of real world people. So are, are, are there apps that uh, can be placed in the hands of, of people who are out there doing stuff? Um, I also want to talk about real, getting data real for a second. And I think everyone knows the term real time. Everyone's heard that, and sometimes we say near real time. So it's not quite real, but it's you know getting realer. Um, the term hyperlocal is used more, but think about real place. Um, so what's what does real place mean? Well, for example, we're in a real place here in the room right now, and everyone who's virtually participating. Well, literally, the air that you're breathing at this very moment what what's in it <laughs> you know do we like i have no clue i will freely admit i have no idea what's in the air that i'm breathing right now um so that's what real place it is is right real where you are and real stuff forgive the colloquialism but that what i just said what stuff is in the air in, in the context we're discussing here you know what, what are the substances uh, the composition and the concentration levels. That's what real stuff means. So getting data real as a theme to think about just kind of in general, um, I'd say for ESIP and all of our friends. Um, it is so important to connect with environmental epidemiologists. And there is so much that we don't know. We, we know that air quality has an incredibly broad range of effects. We don't know what we don't know. There's just a tremendous amount of unknowns. And I think it's really important for this community to try to connect with um, with the human health community. You know, we don't really see many human health people, if any, at ESIP meetings, which I think is really unfortunate. But to kind of connect um, the data science expertise, the earth science expertise in this community with the um, epidemiologists, with the health experts, and use data science to look at the relationships between air quality and health. And I, NASA's done some fun things, not only human health, but also ecosystem health. So NASA's done some really interesting work uh, with the ozone and plant issue. In fact, uh, there's something called ozone gardens that uh, NASA people, you could Google it and read about it. But um, that has like, when you're doing a citizen science effort and people are seeing, oh yeah, the plants are actually not doing well and it's correlated with the ozone levels. Um, that, that's another way to kind of bring home a message about just how impactful this stuff can be. I, I just want to harp on that. I, um, I, I do think we're seeing some of the effects are obvious. There's a lot of subtle impacts from poor air quality, and that's just super, super important. It's not just air, but air is an important domain for this kind of environmental epidemiology. And with that, um, thanks for listening, and I'll close. Right. Thank you so much uh, for all the awesome talks. I know that some of you already asked for the presentations. I know ESIP's going to make them available. We put them into the Google Drive, right? So, um, so definitely, uh, if you are not able to uh, find the presentation, please feel free to email me. Or now you're seeing Steve's email. Email Steve, and he will track us down. Okay. Um, but any. Um, I want to give the uh, opportunity to any last minute questions before we close out the sessions. Again, to, um, no, we, um, we do have uh, more AQ um, sessions uh, throughout this week. Uh, please uh, um, put it onto your calendar and your schedule and, and participate. Does, uh, I know Friday is the big one and also does these, there's a hackathon too, right? Is, is that work? Uh, I'm not sure about the hackathon. All right. Okay, right. So uh, definitely, we are going to be around for the most of this week. Feel free to stop us and ask us about our work. Uh, happy to share. 
and I really want to again thank our speakers. Uh, I know, uh, um, you know, I'm really happy to see some of them first time face to face here. You know, it's like I, like Mohammed, because <laughs> I worked with him for two years. I haven't seen him face to face. So uh, thanks again, and um, I guess I'll see you at uh, during tonight's uh, get together. Okay. Right outside. All right. Thank you.